Fantastic. Um, now, our final question and answer session of the whole forum. And I would like to invite Professor Christian Lucia, Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Geneva, to come to the stage to facilitate it. And if I could ask for all of the past speakers uh, since our last tea break to please uh, come up and join us. Thank you. Hopefully, we will be able to get some questions from the audience as well in this session. Thank you very, very much. So great, we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers and I would like uh, the audience to invite to ask questions and uh, until you're prepared, let me kick off that uh, discussion with a uh, first question of my own. Over the last two days, what I heard several times is that one of the really pressing challenges of today's neuroscience is to understand behavior at cellular resolution. And this is also a little bit the theme that I have again, seen over the last uh, uh, talks, in the last four talks, you know, you, you mentioned, for example, the, the importance of understanding action potentials of identified neurons. You called this the, the common currency. We've heard prior from Mark that one now can record from a thousand neurons uh, with uh, genetic identity of these neurons. So that's uh, it's a, it's a huge progress. We have Gero who tells us how we can then manipulate these neurons. And uh, Michael has very eloquently argued that one has to close the loop to actually establish links of causality. Obviously, this is done in model systems, and it's done with a rather small number of neurons, right? You have like maybe a dozen neurons you controlled, a thousand, or maybe one can have entire populations. But the question of the scalability and how we're really going to be able to get this all the way to behavior and also touch base with uh, no, the human re uh, neurosciences, where we do fMRI on an entire brain, uh, how do you see this? Where are, where are we now? How much have we achieved? And uh, what are the next steps that we need to implement? Who would like to start? Well, if, if, if I may, I, I, sure. I think I expressed my bias um, in the choice of my model organism. The, the, the way we try to solve the issue of scalability is to work in a simple system. So rather than studying cellular phenomena in a very complex setting, so looking at um, a handful or a few hundred cells um, in a large brain structure, such as the cortex or the hippocampus, um, we look at behavior, but in a very simple organism, right? And um, I think that choice of model allows us to transcend the different levels of organization of the nervous system in a way that's currently not possible in large animal species. Um, the second part of your question, how do you link that to human behavior? Um, my answer to that is, and it must be tentative, um, that if evolution teaches us one thing is that it's conservative. So if nature invents a solution to a problem, it's likely that um, a perhaps slightly varied but fundamentally conserved version of that solution is used over and over and over again. So there are general principles one can derive studying Drosophila or C. elegans with 302 neurons that then you can apply and scale up? That is, that is my hunch, yes. Oh. Yuri, you wanted to say something? So the, the challenges in, in different species, of course, are different. In C. elegans, one, and only one neuron is controlling sleep. As we have seen from the presentation from, from Gero, there are a few neurons that are responsible for sleep. We have just recently showed that in order to understand sleep homeostasis, you have to record from a very large number of neurons even in just one structure, either prefrontal cortex or the hippocampus, because their contribution to homeostasis is very different. There are the fast-firing neurons and the slow-firing neurons. And these neurons uh, have different plastic properties when the animal learns. They have they are different uh, uh, connection properties with each other. The fast-firing neurons uh, form a club it's called the Richman club. They get more information from the, the, the rest, and they have access to more neurons and so on. So in order to understand what is preserved, what is the pre-existing structure, and how is it controlling behavior, you have to record from this minority of the neurons. But in order to understand how plasticity occurs in the brain and learning, because we have to record from the others. But how do we know? So what we learned from the brain-machine interface uh, colleagues is that, that typically you record from 100 or 200, 300 slides. Only a handful of neurons are controlling the, the damn robot. But in order to increase performance from 60% to 70%, you have to record from 10 times more. In order to go from 60% or 70% to 80%, 1,000 more. And you need 
10,000 times more in order to get to the performance that I can raise up this uh, uh, glass of water and drink from it. Okay. Maybe I can add yeah, something. Michael. Yeah, so Gary emphasized the importance of, of picking the right model system for uh, answering your questions, but I, w I would like to also emphasize um, the importance of picking the right circuit. And if we choose circuits where we think that a sparse code is representing the information, in other words, where only a very small fraction of the available neurons are active when the circuit is processing information, and that's thought to be true, for example, in barrel cortex, then with the techniques that we have, which are limited to a small subset of the, the neurons in a particular cortical circuit, we actually have a chance of uh, being able to manipulate the neural code only by manipulating small numbers of cells. If we move to areas that are implementing a dense code, then, of course, then we have to find ways of scaling up our technique. Yeah, sure. I mean, that raises also a question to Mark. I mean, how do you select the cells you want to look at? I mean, what is the cell type that you eventually are interested in to understand the coding? And uh, how did you choose the ones you were looking at in the hippocampus? Right. So um, one important aspect that hasn't been emphasized yet is anatomy. And I think, you know, going forward, we need to integrate different approaches to studying circuits and behavior. We heard a lot about imaging and manipulating, but we also have to identify the circuit connectivity of the cells that we're studying. We have to identify their genetic um, identities and their macromolecular uh, phenotypes. So one way of doing this, I think, will be to try to integrate the different tools we have at our, disposable, at our disposal, including those in the genetic, molecular, and um, anatomical realms. Now, I would also emphasize that I think there's a bit of a missing length scale issue. So historically, we have been recording from individual neurons one by one. Of course, we can do much better than that today. But to appeal again to the musical analogy which I made in my talk, imagine that you're trying to decipher what symphony is being played. And initially, you might sample one instrument, just the violin, just the tuba. It may be hard if you listen to the instruments individually to figure out what the overall melody is. You haven't got the gestalt of the music yet. But eventually, if you record from enough instruments, you will figure out, aha, I know that symphony. I get the point. I get the overall you know, thematic evolution of the music. And so I think one of the main virtues of pushing towards larger recording systems is that eventually we may, in fact, be able to do a dimensional reduction of sorts to actually get the point of what is being played, if you will, rather than thinking about it element by element. Now, of course, we need to do this in the context of anatomy, as I was saying, because there are, in fact, not just one orchestra, there are many orchestras throughout the brain. Um, they're connected by a web of different uh, anatomical pathways, and so we need to make use of the information at our disposal to understand how different orchestras in different areas may be working together. Now, in your initial question, you also asked, how are we going to uh, make these data sets relevant to the human? because we have many tools at our disposal in animal studies that simply cannot be applied to the human. Well, one way we can try to tackle this challenge is to perform measurements in our animal models of the very powerful kind that can only be applied in, in animals, at the same time that we take simultaneously measurements that can be done in humans, whether it be fMRI or multi-channel EEG, and we try to learn something about the the underpinning mechanistic reasons that we may be seeing various forms of activity in the more macroscopic modalities, the EEG, the fMRI, and so forth, but to ground them in the microscopic, more mechanistic uh, results that we can uniquely attain in animals. And so that may be one pathway forward um, in the clinic. OK, let me reiterate the invitation to the audience to ask questions as well. Yes, there's a first question. Hi, I'm Giulio Licini from Flinders University. I had a question, if you guys could discuss. Uh, the presentations were really uh, brilliant, some of the best I've ever seen in my life. But I had a question about uh, the technical aspect of potential uh, neurotoxicity of um, the channel rhodopsins and how that may affect the results that you get. Yeah, maybe, Gero, you can answer. That. So I think there's no clear indication that um, any of these optogenetic actuators, um, unless they are activated chronically, have toxic side effects. So many animals, um, are they perfectly tolerate being born with them, having them incorporated into their circuitry, um, and live happily with them. I think the greater risk for toxicity 
um, at least in invertebrate species, comes through the viral delivery methods. Well, that's one issue. And then probably there are differences between channel rhodopsin and some of the pumps, like ARCH Correct. and so forth, right? Which yes. change the ionic environment of these, uh, of these neurons. Yep. Yes. Well, the, just to reflect to this, they, I learned from the my professor of pharmacology is that the side effect of a drug is proportionally if it's life. So you know, we, we know little about uh, these molecules because they are quite new. We already know about halodopsin, for example, that, that halodopsin is not particularly good for silencing neurons for a long time because it helps accumulating calcium, and there is an enormous rebound effect. And if you do something experiment and you think you silence a group of neurons, in fact, what you will find is the consequence of the rebound activity of the neurons rather than the silencing. So we, we, we all know about these problems and mm -hmm. try to fix it. And if, if one looks very, very carefully, there can be, um, th there can be small side effects. So for, for instance, many of these tools um, introduce additional capacitance into the membrane. Um, and that can have very, very small uh, but significant effects, for example, on action potential waveform. Maybe this is an opportunity to re-emphasize the value of simultaneously recording and manipulating from the same neurons. Because if you can co-express a, a calcium sensor or a voltage sensor reporting activity, you can then look over long time periods to see if expression of these probes actually yeah. changes the physiology of the cell. And, and, and I guess it's also, it already underlines sort of the evolution in the field where in the initial optogenetic manipulations, there was really a cross-the-board massive activation, and these uh, manipulations are now refined and tailored to specific needs. And I guess this was very nicely also illustrated in David Anderson's talk, or, or in other examples. You know, if you stimulate, for example, in the basal ganglia, uh, the D1 neurons, the animal will move, and you stimulate the D2 neurons, the animal will stop moving. But when you actually look with the techniques that Mark has developed, they are active at the beginning together. So uh, one may have to really refine the optogenetic interventions. More questions from the audience? No more questions? May I? Can I ask one final question, seeing as it's at the end of the forum? And I just wondered whether or not um, we could end with a bit of a challenge and whether uh, each of you, if you're sitting here again next year, um, what would you like to have reported in terms of a development in your specific fields? Is that a fair question or not? <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> On see the, spot. the sub grid thrown out <laughs> and replaced by a friendly substrate. Okay. It won't happen. There are so many regulatory well, It's good processes. to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I would like to see a closer interaction between experimentalists and theorists, which will provide the best way of coming up with the best theories for explaining how the neural code works in neural circuits. And of course, for me as a, as a clinician neurologist, I guess, uh, you know, as much I'm fascinated by this basic science that we are discussing this afternoon, the question also will arise how we translate this into new therapeutic principles, whether we're going to see some of these genetically uh, mediated therapies in humans in the next 10, 15 years, or whether we need to do this in different ways, more with electrical stimulation, how we can refine those based on what we have learned from the optogenetics. I guess that could be a theme we can more develop next year. Thank you. We're going down the line. Um, for, for me, I think it's also the search for principles that reduce function to something that's more than just a mess of recorded data. Um, there's often this is the, the expectation that understanding will just fall out of um, recording from more and more neurons. Um, but I think it will actually come from better theoretical understanding of some of the principles. So I would like to see continued expansion of the number of different channels, if you will, a number of different ways that we can visualize and uh, manipulate neurons. I'll take optically since that's my approach. So for example, we can now look in only one color. We'll get far more information if we can look in multiple colors, multiple cell populations, manipulate in multiple optical channels simultaneously. We'll be able to interrogate the circuits of interest with far more sophistication and precision. OK, so we've ended with some big challenges. Um, may I ask you to put your hands together, please, for the final panel of the afternoon. Gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>